Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest this week is Jennifer Krippner. Jennifer is the Chief Experience Officer of the Institute for Healthcare Excellence. She has helped transform over 70 organizations around the world since she joined the IHE team back in 2016. And she's been a healthcare leader for over 25 years. She's passionate about relationships, obsessed with humanizing the experience for leaders, physicians, nurses, and of course, patients and their families. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Hello, Laura. So great and lovely to be with you today. Thank you. So now in the midst of all this amazing work that you're doing, I bet you like to have a little bit of fun on the side. Mm -hmm. So tell us what's a fun fact about you. I do love to have fun on the side and I love watching Christmas Hallmark movies so <laughs> much <laughs> that I have applied to be an extra in a Christmas Hallmark movie. I'd love to be an actor someday on one of those. <laughs> oh, what fun. Yes. Now here's the real question. Is there a difference between like Hallmark Christmas movies and Lifetime Christmas movies and the other streaming, you know, the, they have, yeah. all have their themes and it, are you a dedicated Hallmark Christmas movie I am, watcher? I'm a dedicated Hallmark one. Um, they are just true, wholesome, family, good um, Hallmark movies. Very predictable. You always know what's going to happen. And sometimes we need that, don't we? When there's so we much do. chaos and just unhappy, gosh, heaven forbid you turn on the news anywhere. It's just gloom <laughs> and doom. So nice, happy, predictable, 60 minute happy ending is never a bad thing. Exactly. Love it. What fun. And of course, if you do, not if, I take that back, when you land your extras role for your Hallmark movie, you have to let us know. Promise? I sure will. I promise. Okay, good. <laughs> now, aside from your aspiring acting career, yes. tell us about your organization. What exactly is the Institute for Healthcare Excellence? Yes. I'm so glad to be able to share a little bit about what we do at, I'll say just IHE for short, right? Mm -hmm. In healthcare, we love our acronyms. <laughs> yes. So at IHE, we nurture trust, compassion, and teamwork. And we renew that passion for why we went into healthcare in the first place. How we do that is we really create breakthrough opportunities that engage physicians, leaders, teams in a self-sustaining solution for change, really emphasizing on transforming the culture through foundational communication skills and practices. Beautiful. Ultimate, ultimately, our, yeah, ultimately, our goal is to create performance-driven cultures with enhanced well-being, allowing for greater stability and capacities for growth. I'm glad to hear that there's a nice, strong communications core yes. in the middle of that, because I don't know how people try to work without including that as part of a training, especially in change, yeah. uh, change culture, transformational culture management. Right. Uh, so super excited to hear how that comes into your world today. Yes. No, go ahead. Thanks for asking for that, because communication is the foundation, right, of everything that we do. And it's super important for our, our healthcare leaders and physicians and nurses to have that skill. Absolutely. And for the record, everybody, I did not prompt her to say that. <laughs> this is just the recognition of, of the reality that we live in. If you can't communicate effectively with your team, mm -hmm. there's not going to be much of a team. Right. So let's figure out how Jennifer does that. Um, tell us a little bit about a misconception, perhaps some, you, something that you wish more people understood. And what is your role in changing that misperception? Yeah. Great question, because I really think that when we talk about culture transformation, it sounds great. It's what kind of we all aspire to, but it doesn't happen overnight. And I think even especially today in today's society, it seems like everybody wants that quick fix, right? We want an app to do the work or we want a checklist um, that will help individuals know how to um, really what's required of them to be an engaged employee, like tell me what I need to do today to be to have that um, transformation happen to me. And I like to see leaders invest in their teams, invest in their people. And culture transformation takes time, it takes commitment, and might I add, it takes courage um, for people to really trust the process for those human-centered communication skills to yes. take root, to build, and to flourish. And when I think about that, I think relationships are at the core of that. And that cannot be changed overnight. It can't be changed with those silver bullets, those tactics or action plans. And so I like to think about 
that commitment to skill development, to leadership role modeling, and that time to really have those relationships grow. And when I work with an organization and I partner with them to build those strategies, I like to call it like a slow IV infusion. <laughs> and that's <laughs> In IV, not terms. Ivy like Ivy League. Ivy right. Plans. No, like the IV that drips. Yes. yes. It's kind of that slow drip, right? That over time, we're going to really build that process of culture transformation, build those foundational principles of those key communication skills and develop that so that maybe in 18, 24 months, we can start to see that culture transformation take place. I think that's I'm, the idea of investing in your teams and working on that communication. And it doesn't happen overnight. The, mm -hmm. I think so often we want the pill, we want, like you said, the app or a silver bullet, and there just aren't any yet. There's lots that may claim to be it, but they're not sustainable. They may be quick fixes, but you right. can have a ch momentary change in behavior. That doesn't mean there's an underlying culture change. Mm -hmm. So uh, kudos to you for distinguishing that. Yes. What about, was there ever a time when you thought that you did a great job in explaining something only to have the listener look at you like a deer in the headlights? Mm -hmm. What do you think happened? What assumptions were made without realizing it? Uh, what happened? Well, I think, you know, I've always thought I was a pretty good listener and paid attention to my team pretty well. <laughs> and um, I think when I in my previous job, um, I had really great one-on-ones or so I thought with my team members. And when I started to think about maybe changing um, organizations, I went to um, some workshops that the Institute for Healthcare Excellence put on to just kind of investigate if this was an organization I wanted to be part of. And then I did, I realized um, there that um, maybe I wasn't as present as I could have been, or mm -hmm. maybe my listening skills weren't as great because when I went back to my uh, my organization before I chose um, to leave, I was in a one-on-one -on -one and one of my team members paused during our one-on-one -on -one and said to me, she had the courage to say to me, you know what, I'm, would you mind just giving me the last 20 minutes of our one-on-one -on -one and um, you're kind of distracted right now. You're looking at your computer that, you know, notifications keep going off and your phone keeps, you know, beeping. And I'd really like us to get through the last 20 minutes of our one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, I took that time to just really apologize to her. And I think if I hadn't gone through that training the week before, I wouldn't have really realized how distracted and how I wasn't listening um, intent as intently as I thought I had been before in the past. And so I think that was a moment for me that I was like, oh, I had assumed I was really good. And I, I really wasn't. I had a lot to learn. And just by having um, some of those foundational skills the week before and then having this um, team member have the courage to confront me um, that was really powerful and I've been learning ever since. Yeah. I would imagine when she did bring that up to you, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, I'm sure it took her a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what the inner monologue stream of consciousness was when as, to receive that, because yes. anytime we get called on something, yes. the fight or flight reflex tends to kick in. Yeah. Um, the, we get a little defensive, we get a little... What went through your mind? What were the mm -hmm. stages of, of the logic? And then what did you, you mentioned that you did end up apologizing to her. So I you did. owned it, which yeah. is beautiful, but I'm guessing it wasn't just an instantaneous, oops, okay, let me fix that. Right. But right. what was the internal line? Yeah, I immediately was like, what? No, not me, right? I, I, I do this well. And I just went to a class on it last week, right? <laughs> <laughs> and now you're, it was just the timing was really interesting. And I think I, I, I did pause. I kind of sat back in my chair and looked at her because she was really important to me. This relationship was really important to me and I am passionate about relationships. So I did have to just sit back and pause for a moment and really take inventory of were those things on my computer or my phone 
really that important to me in that moment that I could, was it a crisis that was happening that I had to take care of or mm. not? And why were, why was I allowing that to interrupt our time together? Yes. Could it wait? And, and why had I gotten into such a habit of that? And I think multitasking is a habit we've yes. all gotten into and we don't right. even know we do it. And was I that important of a leader? That I, you know, I think we wear this badge of honor sometimes like, oh, I'm so busy. I've got all these tasks. I've got all these things. People need me, you know, and I, I'm a busy, important person and I'm really, I'm not, we're not. And when we have that honor of having somebody in our presence, regardless of who they are, I think at that moment to me was like 20 minutes. I have 20 minutes to give her undivided attention. She is important to me. And it was, it, it, and that's where that apology came from is like, you're right, 20 minutes. You have my undivided attention. I'm here for you now. I don't have any excuses. That's so beautiful. I love the fact that you framed it as you have the honor of having someone in your mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if they work for you, how many levels down, if they're a vendor, if they're a, it doesn't matter who right. outranks who in whatever capacity. Right. This person has given you their time, mm -hmm. which I'm sure they feel is equally valuable. And, and I love the honesty of recognizing that we all, our ego always wants to get mm -hmm. this, but I'm important there. These messages are important. I need to know who needs, who's right. talking to me now then. And there's also, of course, that, um, that little dopamine kick every time yes. we hear the bing, that very Pavlovian sense yes. of, oh, I heard the bell. Where's, where's the, <laughs> the message, the pellet, right. the whatever right. it is. I have that compulsion to look, but that feeling like, but, uh, but I'm important. I have to know what's going on really yeah. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Can yes. you wait? So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being honest mm -hmm. about that and frankly, throwing all the rest of us under the bus and vocalizing exactly what <laughs> we are thinking, but don't necessarily want to admit yeah. to ourselves. I think that's really powerful. I think that also goes true because I was um, guilty of doing this too. I'm constantly late to meetings or things mm. like that when I was working at that hospital and I'm like, oh, I'm back to back to meetings. And then I'd be five minutes late. And I'm like, I would run into the meeting. Well, I'm really sorry. I'm late. I ran into this person in the hallway and I did that. And, you know, my other meeting ran over. And what I really found was that it really diminished that other person. Like you're not valuable enough to be on time for. And this other person that you ran into the hall is more important to me. So I, after that conversation, I kind of stopped and thought, I am just going to apologize one for being late. And I'm going to stop there. I'm really sorry I'm late. I'm here now for you. Let's get started. Yes. Because all of those other excuses really weren't effective or weren't helping the situation. And so that was really important to me with my apology there. That's really beautiful. And I, I being able to take stock and say, I'm here for you mm -hmm. now. And yeah, boy, there's so many different directions we can go on that. Okay, so <laughs> moving, and I think that that's really a great example of vulnerability mm -hmm. in leadership and being yeah. able to say that, nope, this was my mistake and yeah. uh, to, to move on from there. So tell me about a time when you needed to assert yourself powerfully. Mm. What were you thinking and feeling? Yeah, that's been a hard one for me. I don't know. I think maybe a lot of leaders have that as well, but- um, you know, I've, I think for me, really having somebody tell me to lower my expectations, mm. I have high expectations. And in my previous, previous job, um, I held pretty strong to our vision and our mission, and they were really my true North, my guide in what we did. And, mm. um, we had opened a brand new hospital in um, Minnesota and really were asked to, to build and deliver and hire to something different than had ever been built in Minnesota. And so I felt pretty strong about, we need to just make sure we deliver on that promise. And several years into it, we were very successful and um, there were a lot of outside um influences that were pressuring our organization to just do things like everybody else was doing them. And, and we were the leaders 
we're asked to do something different. And as you can imagine, that's that's difficult to go against the grain. <laughs> and so, you know, halfway into my my work there, I was asked to kind of like, you know what, you really just, for this, you need to just lower your expectations. You just need to settle back and just go with the, with the rest of the, the rest of the system and, and what's being expected. And I had a really hard time with that. I would imagine. I would imagine. How did you respond when you were told to just um, sit back and, and let it go? Well, I felt really strong about helping the, the full team stay true to kind of what we were asked to live up to, um, not only for our team, but for the providers, for the community, for everybody. And so it was difficult, but I really felt like I needed to stay just true to my true north for one. I felt like it was something, a conviction for me as a leader. So um, I really um, felt like, could I just be consistent kind of with our brand, with our guide, with the things that we had in motion already? Could I keep that consistency moving forward? Um, could I, where could I compromise? where what they were asking me to kind of lower my expectations on, was there a way to kind of compromise that didn't take us far away from our vision? And then how could I use stories? How could I use stories from the community? Or how could I use stories from our providers and nurses? How could I use stories from our patients to really sell the success of what we were already doing with our vision and our brand to push back on why we weren't going to kind of settle or lower our expectations. And by not making it about me or making it personal for me um, and letting our success and those stories from the outside help, that's really what helped those compromises be true. And so kind of stepping back. That's how I manage that one. Um, letting others help tell those stories and bring that influence. Um, assert the power was really how I helped not totally lower my expectations and compromise. <laughs> <laughs> so it, and I think it's interesting to note that speaking powerfully doesn't necessarily have to mean dropping the hammer. It doesn't have right. to mean yelling doesn't have to mean, you know, fist pounding and all that, but just choosing to push back sometimes in a very indirect way of right. can be referred to as leadership from behind sometimes leadership from the side as opposed mm -hmm. to leadership from the front, uh, but just being able to say, okay, what resources mm -hmm. do we need? And this should be distinguished, of course, between passive aggressive resistance. Right. And leadership. This is pushing back and with saying, I need this to happen. I'm not willing to lower standards. Mm -hmm. This is not in the best interest of my clients, of my team, of anybody else, but of our patients, of course, right. most importantly. Mm -hmm. So what do we need? What information do we need? What resources do we need? Who else needs to tell it? Maybe I'm not the right voice mm -hmm. for it. I'm going to amass the right people who will share the right stories, information, statistics, whatever it is, yes. but not just the message, the messenger matters. And if you're not the right messenger mm -hmm. for that piece in the moment, then find the right messenger to deliver it. And you can speak just as powerfully through someone else. I think that's a fascinating mm -hmm. angle. That's exactly it. Yeah. And how was it received when that was done? It was received well, and um, absolutely. And I think when you you gather the right people and you gather the right stories and you do have that success um, to back it up, I think not having to lower your expectations and just say, okay, whatever, whatever you want to do is fine. I think if you've got the right stories and you've got the right success and metrics to back it up. I think there's really no arguing at that point, but definitely um, if I were to say, you know what, I don't agree with you and here's why. And it's just me saying that sometimes it is all about the messenger. And so it, I think it, it worked for me in that way um, that it wasn't me just asserting myself and, and my power and in, in, in the, in the role that I had at the time. So, yes. 
Exactly. And you still managed to get done what you needed to do. Right. So there are many, many ways to mm -hmm. affect that change. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Jennifer, this brings us to a fun little uh, direction change. This is our listener 24 hour influence challenge. So I would love to invite you to talk directly to our audience and challenge them to take one step that they can complete in the next 24 hours to have more influence. How would you like to challenge our listeners today? That is a fun challenge. So influence challenge for the next 24 hours. I like to do an end of day check-in every day myself. And it really begins with a positive focus as an end of day reflection. And I really think we're hardwired to remember the negative at, a, at the end of every day. And so I really think by being able to influence, we have to come at it from a positive angle. So my end of day check-in is thinking of these three points. The first one is what went well today? So writing down one thing that went well, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. The second is thinking about one person that contributed to your good day, acknowledging that person either by writing them a text, an email, or a handwritten note and thanking them for what they contributed to your day. And the third item of your end of day check-in is who can you help be at their best tomorrow? Hmm. So thinking about somebody that you're going to interact with tomorrow and really elevating them and helping them be their best tomorrow. So those are your three things to do at the end of today is determine what went well, who contributed to your good day today, and then who can you help be their best self tomorrow. And this is not a challenge that is going to take 24 hours to figure out. This is yeah. when you clock out today, before you go home from work, before you leave your home office and close the door and go down to dinner, or frankly, before you go to bed. But this is what, a, this could be a two minute exercise. It could be a two minute exercise. And I, I just love what happens when you do this and you could get in a habit of doing it every day, but it really taps into those positive emotions. And when we do that frequently in small doses, it can really change the way our outlook is. It can help us make that kind of shift in our mindset. It helps us connect with others. It helps us lift others up. And it just, it's really powerful. And I love building the habit of positive emotions over time. And you do this every day? I do it every day. Beautiful. I can't say it better than that. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> Tell me about a time uh, what's the most nervous that you ever felt before a presentation or a speaking engagement? And what communication related lessons did you learn from that experience? Oh, great. Well, I always think um, if you're nervous, you really, really care about it. And mm. so I don't think, I think being nervous is, can be a really good thing. But this example that I have is I was pretty new to the Institute for Healthcare Excellence. Um, my leader and I were going to do some work with military physicians in training, and he woke up that morning sick. And so he asked me to start the day off without him. So it was just um, the two of us. It was going to be the two of us. So I had to walk into this military hospital and work with a bunch of physicians on my own. And again, I was pretty new. Um, I was nervous. I felt really inadequate. I felt actually sick to my stomach myself, but not because I was sick, because I was nervous. Mm. Um, but I had to show up. I had to do it. Um, and I, I just, I walked into the room and I started the work and I realized that they didn't know what I knew. And they were looking at me to be the expert in content and facilitation, and they were there to learn from me. And so I just walked in and began the work um, like I had been trained to do, and I just did the best that I could do and knew that the, they would learn valuable information from me and it would help them on their journey and that my leader would get there when when he could and and we would just build on what the training had started from. So, And did that help your nerves come down? Did it help you focus? How do you think that the program was received in the end? Yeah, it really helped me focus to, to just put my mindset aside when I walked in the room, like they don't know this content, I do. 
I'm going to be delivering and training them on this content and facilitating the work with them. And so they're not going to know if I say the wrong thing. They're not going to know if I say it in the wrong order. Um, I know it enough that they're going to be able to learn from me. And so that's that really helped me just to walk in, put my hands on my hips and <laughs> put in that power stance and and just I had no other choice at that time. So I knew that once um, my my co-leader would come on board that we'd be able to um, just level up at that time and, and bring them up to speed if if there were things that maybe I would need to um, bring them up to speed on. Yes, yes. And I've always said that remembering that when you are presenting someone, especially if you're leading a training, mm -hmm. it's it's a gift. You're there to be generous. Mm -hmm. Other people are not standing there with like some stereotypical cartoon high school English teacher with the dripping red pen, just waiting mm -hmm. to ding you on everything. They're right. all thinking the same thing. Please give me something of value. Yes. Help me do my job better tomorrow. Help me get clear on something. Help me get better at something. And they just want to know that this is going to be a good use of their time. So right. if you can provide them something mm -hmm. to be the speaker you would like to see. Right. That's exactly it. And that's what I did. And I felt like it was really, I mean, we had three days with them. So a half a day wasn't a terrible to do on my own, but um, it was, it was great. And I think it helped me be a better um, facilitator. I think to just jump in and, and do it. And I learned more about myself during that time um, and gave, gave myself more confidence by, by having to do it that way. I would imagine that's, that's, it's one thing to jump in and lead a meeting, to lead a half hour or an hour long discussion, but to lead a half day workshop, mm -hmm. that's a lot of focus. That's a lot of energy. I do a lot of those. And so to, to have to do it without the prep, they have the full preparation, especially if it's your first time, you're used to being a partner or the sidekick, or yeah. you're used to being, but not the focal leader of sorts to have to step into that role almost mm -hmm. impromptu. I mm -hmm. uh, give you a lot of credit for doing that. That would yes, definitely be yes. uh, intimidating <laughs> to just about anybody. Yes. Then what about, uh, it, was there ever a time when you had to, you really wanted to ask someone for something, whether it was advice, support, an opportunity, or just maybe to meet for coffee mm -hmm. and uh, to get to know each other, but it was really hard to work up the courage to make the ask. When did you finally make that, pull that trigger and what happened? Well, I have a little bit different angle on this one, okay. but it is making the ask. And I, so I've been the executive co-chair for the past five years of the largest attended fundraising event in Minnesota. And about two years ago, we decided that our theme would be called um, Together. And I really wanted this certain Nash International Band to come and sing the song. They had a song named Together back then. And so for the gala, and I thought, well, why not just try to find somebody in Nashville that would know them and ask them if they'd come to Minnesota and sing at our gala. And it was just really a shot in the dark. I didn't know anybody in Nashville. I didn't know how to reach them. So I spent a couple days Googling um, the band and found an email address. And I sent them this really long email with all the details about our gala and the, the mission and, and why we wanted them to come and sing. And within an hour, I got an email back saying, yes, we want to provide you with, with a, uh, with a very special video. We'll record a song just for you. Oh, wow. We'll give you VIP tickets to our Minneapolis concert for your live auction. And it was just kind of out of a whim that I decided to do this. And, and it turned out to be just a really magical experience. So I think just go for it. If you're going to, if you're, if you want something and you want to have a connection or you want to ask for something, find a way to do it. You just, they could have not responded and I would have just gone on to the next thing, but um, you just don't know what's going to happen if you don't ask. Absolutely. And I've always said, whether it's asking someone 
for a, a for advice, asking someone for a promotion, asking someone on a date. Mm -hmm. If you don't ask, the answer is already no. Yes. The only difference is you've rejected yourself for them. Exactly. Don't make it easy on them. Make them do the, <laughs> nobody likes to say no. Right. So make them do the hard work. Make them have to either look at you in the face or talk to you on the phone or right. Uh, right, respond to your email, whatever it is, make them say no and do it as opposed to just shooting yourself down. But right. no, pull the trigger, make the ask. Pull and the look, you can get a band to write a whole song just for you. I know. It was wonderful. I would imagine. I have not heard that one before. That's for yeah. sure. Finally, Jennifer, what's something that you do to create a little bit more fun for your team? Well, because we travel all over the country and work with healthcare organizations in their own locations, we get to travel to fun places. So if we go to a fun new city like Nashville or San Diego or Los Angeles, we get to go to like Grand Old Opry for dinner or oh. Coronado Island for dinner or Disneyland for lunch. <laughs> so we try to explore some new and fun places wherever we are. And it just goes for making great memories with the team. And it's fun to do. I would imagine that taking people to Disneyland for lunch would be extremely difficult because no one would want to leave. And you're there for <laughs> lunch, then to turn around and go work for the rest of the afternoon yeah. would be a little bit like trying to drag people away. Do you find that you have to make it a really long lunch hour? Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Those are good problems to have though, aren't they? Such good problems. All right. Well, Jennifer, this has been a lot of fun. How can people learn more about you and the Institute? Great. You can visit our website at ihe-team.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Jennifer Krippner on LinkedIn. That's a great way as well. Otherwise, I'm sure there'll be great information in the show notes today. Of course, we'll put all of your bio, we'll put your links, we'll put your social media. And um, is is that the best? What's the best social media platform for them? LinkedIn is the best platform. LinkedIn is the best. Great. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll have the URL for the website for the organization itself. So thank you so much for joining us today. Such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And to everybody else out there, thank you as always for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And of course, give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.